Hey everybody, how's it going? I'm Chase Jarvis. Welcome to another episode of the Chase Jarvis Live show here on Creative Live. You guys know this show. This is where I sit down with the world's top creators, entrepreneurs, and thought leaders, and I do my very best to unpack their brains and help you live your dreams and career and hobby and in life. My guest today is the most booked female speaker in the world. <laughs> Former radio host that's not doing radio <laughs> anymore. You can hear her. Don't, don't look over there yet. And she's the author of a couple books, most recently, The Five Second Rule. She's got a TED Talk with 10 million views. My guest is the Mel Robbins. Hey! Yay! I'm hugging you. Oh, hi. awesome, hi. awesome. They love you. Welcome to Creative Live. You do Thank you. Tomorrow. Um, I'm, I got you first, though, right here on the show. Yes. Welcome to the show. Um, Thank you for taping in black and white. That's yes. wonderful for women because we don't have to worry about the makeup so much. People have asked me. <laughs> so the black and white thing, it started. Yeah, like, why uh, the hell do you uh, do that? Okay. So um, my background is as a photographer. I stalked and, you. And a filmmaker. And one of the things that I realized in my long, illustrious career as a photographer is that just generally things look better in black and white. So that was a thing. Yeah. More particularly, it, it is reductive. Um, element. It takes a lot of the distraction out. Like colors, all these different tonals are they're arguably a distraction. And I wanted people to focus on the conversation, just the two humans. So the fact that it is reductive and simplifies things, yep. the fact that it makes everybody look like 25% better, and the fact that you can put all kinds of different lights and you can film like next to a window and the temperature of this light is going to be the same as the window and it's gotcha. made it very easy. So all those things together made it black and white. And seven years ago when the show started, there were no other such shows on the internet. It was the first of its kind and um, it was it helped, it helped define it. So I don't know of another black and white mm -hmm. talk show. There you go. Mm -hmm. Seriously, I don't. And, and uh, so I did wear uh, a lighter, well, brown, mm -hmm. So I wouldn't be just a floating head. Because if I wore I all black, what that would be this? a problem. I haven't, I haven't learned much from my own format. Oh, you got arms format. sticking true, out, I do so you're arms. fine. I have arms. <laughs> um, so that's a little background of the show. But it's like we're really emphasizing the audio portion of it, which is something I want to talk to you about, obviously, yep. with the radio. Um, so it's really moved more into podcast. But it used to be filmed only live. We had an in-studio audience of usually 100 or so people. And that just got a little heavy. And now I'm doing this thing every week. It used to be once a month, and now it's every week. So... That's a little backstory. So, show. is there? Do you take the audio of this and make Syndicated. that a podcast? Yes. Gotcha. Okay. Yeah. And so, I've only seen the video yeah. side of it. There okay. you go. Gotcha. There you go. It's a very popular podcast as well. Usually up there in the featured section on iTunes, next to a bunch Congratulations. of. Congratulations! I'm happy about it. Um, but you're here, and this is about you. So let's stop talking about the show. We're going to shift gears, kunk, and. Um, I want to start back at the beginning, way back in the day. Okay. Not really. It was the first thing that we talked about for you professionally, which was radio. Gotcha. Oh, so, I thought you were going to talk about when my parents met in Kansas and my father got my mother pregnant at the age of 19. Oh. The most amazing part of that story, because yes. mm -hmm. she dropped out of college to have me, okay. is that they are still married. High five. 50 years later. How cool is that? So we just shared, you just shared with me that you had been married 20 years. I then 21. shared. 21. Sorry. Yeah, I, I, just, I get credit for that extra I, one. I'm not Trust taking me. anything away from you, Mel. <laughs> oh this, and then what I shared, I reciprocated some sharing, which is that I also have been married 20 years. Congratulations. Like, five days ago or something like that on the 20. Uh, Second. Pressure, pressure. 22nd. Yes. Of August. Mine's the 24th. Yep. That's why we yep. I know this. We so I'm not that, that much of a stalker. But here's another thing that's parallel. Yes. Is that your parents have been married 50 years. Uh-huh. My parents' 50th wedding anniversary was the 26th of August. No kidding. No kidding. Wow, that's that? really cool. We have the, we have many of the same. You guys have sandwiched us. Mm -hmm. You and your wife Kate. Yep. 22nd, and your parents are 26th, and I'm the 24th. There you go. There you go. And your parents have been married 50 years too. Same with mine. Yeah. Here we are. Here we Not are. Not going back to Kansas. I though I, <laughs> I I have been to Kansas. I like Kansas. It's nice. It's hot. Midwestern. I think you identify very yep. vocally as a Midwestern person. Um, but I want to talk about early career in radio. I, one of the things that fascinates me is your ability to move seamlessly between genre, again, radio, and author, speaker. I think there's some similarities there, but they require a different set of skills. You've been able to move seamlessly between them. So let's start at the start. How in the hell did you get your start in radio? Oh, my gosh. This is a big question. Well, no. We my whole life is like one gigantic mistake that I then scramble using anxiety to try to fix. 
<laughs> and so, you know, I, I graduated from college and I, I don't know what I want to do. So I follow my boyfriend to D.C. and I end up as a paralegal because I got a temp job. And then I don't know what to do as he's going to school. So I apply to law school. And so then I go to law school and I hate it. And I don't know what I'm going to do. When I, I mean, like every <laughs> step of my freaking life has been literally like a leapfrog game. OK, we're going to hop into this thing. Oh, shit. Now what do I do? Um, you. I mean, before I even got into the media, I was a public defender in Manhattan. I did wow. violent felony criminal defense work as a legal aid attorney. Wow. Yeah. Uh, and this is the thing you just like, got a degree in law on the side because your boyfriend was in well, D.C.? Well, we broke up, so that didn't, you know, I was not, I did not, he's not the one I'm married to. Um, yeah, I didn't know what to do. I mean, I think I felt for a large part of my life lost and searching for my thing. This is why you're on the show. And you you have a thing that I think of the people who are watching and listening right now, that is the dominant paradigm, is people haven't found their thing yet, and they think something is wrong with them. And part of the goal of this show is to A, say that there's nothing wrong with you, and B, what what are you gonna do about it? Right. So there's a, there's a tactical component of it. So clearly you did something, and it sounds like you experimented. You went to oh law school. Oh my gosh! You... I yes, I just kind of jumped from one, and it was misery mm -hmm. that propelled me. So I seriously, I would, I would. She really sugarcoats things. Like that's what I like. I'm just kidding. Uh, <laughs> I I literally was. I, I loved being a public defender, and then cr my husband, cr his name is Christopher Robbins. Isn't wow, that awesome? Amazing. He looks like an adult Christopher Robbins too, with like curly blonde hair and everything. Um, I, I mean, I, I, I'm, I don't want to go off on a huge tangent because I know that there's a bunch of other tactical stuff that we want to talk about. Yeah, yeah. Um, okay. But this but, is a story, too, so tell us. Yeah, story. no, I, I was really lost. I graduated from, from Dartmouth, and, um, you know, you're supposed to have the answers, Ivy League school, whatever. I had no idea what I wanted to do or study, so I get a temp job. I go to a, work for a law firm. I spent an entire year sitting in a conference room. Um, there was this thing called a bait stamp. And uh, there was a huge litigation going on over whether or not biodegradable trash bags actually biodegraded. And there was some big class action lawsuit. And I sat for an entire year in God. a conference room. Chee -chee, flip the paper. Chee -chee, flip the paper. Chee -chee, flip the paper. Because in 1990, we didn't have any computers. This was how you documented every piece of evidence in a class action lawsuit. There uh, is so much paperwork, and it was endless. And I, I didn't. I mean, I didn't enjoy that. And none of the lawyers that worked there seemed all that happy. But I also had this thing careening toward me, which was my boyfriend at the time, who I loved dearly, was uh, had gotten into a, a, a school in Boston. And um, I didn't have anything to do. So, you so I was going to get left behind. Uh -huh. And so I applied to law schools and ended up getting into one in Boston. And so off I went. And I went thinking, well, I don't have to practice law. And then what happens, and this happens to all of us, is we, we have like the plan A, which is I'm not going to be a lawyer. Mm -hmm. But then we go with plan B because it seems easier. And inertia and kind of being where you're at, whether it's a job that you hate or it's a relationship that, that sucks, but you, you don't, you're scared of leaving it. You know, I was, I, I like jumped into that law school river and next thing you know, three years later, I get carried down the path and I look up and I'm like, oh my gosh, I'm doing exactly what I didn't want to do. Yep. Now, luckily, um, I ended up getting a job uh, with legal aid, and it was an incredible four years working uh, in the criminal court system in New York City. And then Chris, who is now my husband, we've been married 21 years, he got into business school in Boston. This is like a reoccurring theme. I get dragged <laughs> up to Boston by some dude, you know, and I've got no plan. So I remember I left this job. I, I, I left court on a Friday in Manhattan. We lived in Chelsea on 21st between 6th and 7th before it was a nice place to live. I know exactly. I could picture it. Yep. Mm -hmm. And um, I left work. We packed up the U-Haul. We drove up to Boston, Massachusetts. We moved into this little apartment. And Monday morning came, and he went off to his new job and to his executive MBA program, and I was on the futon 
with the dog and my freaking pajamas thinking, what the hell just happened? Like, I, I went from being a somebody that had, like, a job I loved to nothing. And what am I going to do? And so what fascinates me about human beings, and it fascinates me about um, myself, is that we have such a high tolerance for suckiness. Isn't it crazy? As long as the suckiness is a routine. But the second you get thrown out of your routine or the second that whether it's because you lose a job or somebody moves or somebody dies or somebody breaks up with you or you break, like all of a sudden that awakens the courage in you to make a change. Because, you, you know, either you have no choice or now you got a problem to solve. Yeah. But fighting that inertia of life is the most difficult thing in the world. And so, you know, you asked me a different question, which was how I got into radio. No, but this is all leading up to it, clearly. Yeah. Right? Um, you know, I, I ended up getting a job with a law firm because it was the path of least resistance. In Boston. In Boston. Okay. I hated it because I went from being in the courtroom to writing briefs all day. Got it. And luckily, I got pregnant with our first daughter, who just is starting college, which makes me feel so ancient. <laughs> I just want to, like, punch myself in the face <laughs> that I have a... 18-year-old freshman in college. Congratulations. Um, thank you. Um, but I got pregnant with her, and when she was born, I had horrific postpartum depression. Wow. I mean, the really scary kind, where you can't be alone with the baby. You're on crazy meds that turn you, not the kind you take recreationally. Yeah. Like, these are the kind that, like, turn you into a zombie. And wow. it was a really scary thing. And I, I when I kind of came out of the eight-week trance of that, I looked up at Chris and said, I've made a decision. And he said, okay, what would that be? And I said, I don't ever want to answer the question, what do you do for a living with the response, I'm a lawyer. And he said, okay, you realize we've just bought this house and we have a kid and uh, we a have bills to pay. Yeah. And he yeah. said, so here's the deal. You've got exactly four weeks before your maternity leave is over. You need to make $60,000. I don't care what you do for a living. That's your problem. Go solve it. And the night before I was supposed to, so I networked like a crazy person. Because again, if you're a human being with a problem, you'll solve it. Yeah. And so, if it matters enough to you. And so, uh, I, I got a job, at, and this was the first dot-com boom in Boston. I got a job the night before I was supposed to go back. This was one of the worst experiences of my life. So, imagine this. You've been on maternity leave for four months. Okay. You have been networking like crazy in secret to get a different job. You're not going to leave the industry. Here's the problem. You, find, you get the job, but you have to go back in for your first day back. To quit. To quit. And there's no, like, I don't even, not sure we had email back then, you know what I mean? Like, oh this, my was, God. this was, this, this was like not really the big email days. I mean, yeah. maybe it was just kind of starting. Yeah. So it's not really something you did. I think we still had a fax machine there at you the, go. At the you law Fax firm. in your, your, uh... So <laughs> this story gets so much worse. So I, I go in on the train and I'm dressed as if I'm still a lawyer and I go into the high rise and I go up the elevator and I walk in and they are throwing me a baby shower. No. <laughs> no. Yes. So you had to play along for a certain amount of time. I or, actually or... announced it at the baby shower. Wow, that's bold. Well, I... You'd made a decision. I had made a decision, and I think that um, people who live with either anxiety or things that are not complete, have not yet made a decision to move on. Mm. And, you know, I had, I have struggled with anxiety for a lot, you know, for most of my adult life. And I have two kids that have anxiety because they won the genetic lottery with me, you know, so they yeah. got the ADD, dyslexia, anxiety, woo, what a casserole yeah, mom right. gave you. <laughs> um, and, uh, it brewed so much under the surface for me that I remember feeling so uncomfortable that I wanted to end the discomfort. And the only way to end the discomfort, if you're lying about something or if you're withholding something, is to actually say what's so. 
And that's what you did when you yeah. walked in. Yeah, I just, I, I actually just walked in and said something like, I, I, I'm first like stunned. Thank you. I everybody. feel grateful and I feel horrible because I've, I'm coming in today because I realize I cannot come back to work. And there was this, <laughs> you know, talk about like, yeah. wow. Um, and so then I, I, I asked the woman that I reported to if I could talk to her. And I just went in and kind of, I think I'm, I'm sure I started crying. I mean, I was, you know. <laughs> uh, I can like imagine. Awful. Typical. The, the yes. postpartum rebound. Uh-huh. The just new job. huge disappointment. Oh I was already so amped up. You know how you get yourself so jacked up to have to have a tough conversation? Yep. yep. So anyway. Well, I, first of all, before we go on to actual radio, this like embedded in your story is so many things that this show is about that creative live stands for that is helping people unpack a lot of these things because there are so many barriers that keep us from the things that we want um so many of them there's i i have another show called the daily creative and i was just answering some questions right before this show and maybe i'll stick around and we can do an episode together because sure. one of them is about depression yeah and like that is a real like depression and anxiety my understanding is that the phenomenon uh, is dramatically increasing as culture shifts. That anxiety is not going away; it's multiplying. It's becoming a habit. It is. It's a. It's a. It's an. Epidemic. We're going to talk about it actually in the course. Excellent. So it's interesting because you asked me um, before we went live, mm -hmm. what are how do you describe yourself? And it's always a conundrum for me, mm -hmm. because I actually don't consider myself an expert. I consider myself to be your like fucked up friend that figured things out and has become wise. And now I don't want you to make the same mistakes I did. Yeah. Because figuring out some of the things that I have learned by stumbling into the five second rule, which we'll talk about, and mm -hmm. then researching it because of the, the fact that it went viral and had such a profound impact for people, what I've learned about the science of habits, what I've learned about the science of confidence, what I've unpacked about the way that self-doubt works, what I've now started to see about the, the, the crazy mistakes that I made and, and how hard I made my life for myself, yeah. for my friends. Like the solutions are so simple. And so I'm on a mission to share everything that I've learned, not because I think I'm right, but because I hope it makes you think about how you're doing it. And I hope that it saves you some of the hassles and the heartache and the headache that I put myself, my family, my friends, particularly myself through. Yeah. And so a lot of it has to do with anxiety. A lot of it has to do with um, self-doubt and how that um, really creeps in and becomes a habit and how that impacts your actions. And so... Anyway. Right, I'm going to abandon, I don't even care about how you got into radio now. You've just opened up the box. So I'm going to shift gears yeah, if we sure. can and go, you, you just listed a handful of things. Like a lot of what you talk about is anxiety. A lot of what mm -hmm. you talk about is unpacking the things that are keeping you from the things that you want to do and be. So let's start at the start. Sure. Like talk about anxiety for a second. Uh, you know, I came out of the womb with anxiety. I think I just was, my kids, all, my parents always said that I was a worrier. And that's right. what you say about kids, right? Yeah. Because you wring your hands or you, you know, get nervous about tests or you're chugging Melanta. Remember Milk of Melanta or whatever the hell it was called? I, we would buy that by the case. I mean, that's what a freak I was. Get nervous before the tennis match. I'd have to come home because I was homesick. I was, I mean, I was constantly on edge. And it wasn't until I turned, I think it was 21, that, and it was when I was in law school, that the panic really started to be there every morning. Like I had bouts of anxiety that were more triggered by particular things that oh, I was anxious about. Or, uh, oh, no, no, I'm talking about being a kid, like having to swim out to the Red Dock. Got it. Not being invited to a party. Yeah. Having to go to sixth grade camp for a week. Um, you know, uh, playing were, at band camp. You know, like, those were still things, right? And so yeah. the 21-year-old you is like, this is just omnipresent oh, daily. Oh, you know, it was the waking up with a pit in my stomach every morning. It was walking into class and having just this awful sense of dread. It was getting called on and even though I knew the answer, having a tidal wave of heat rise up through my body. 
Um, it was turning beet red in the face, you know, as I was taught, like just on, and it was being a liar. I mean, I used to lie all the time because I was so anxious about saying the wrong thing that I was constantly trying to think of what I should be telling people. Wow. And then, of course, you're nervous because you can't remember what the hell you just told them. So, yeah. obviously, it's compounding. It's, yes, yes, it's compounding. And so, um, I started to have these panic attacks. And I didn't know what was wrong. And I went to see one of the like health people at campus and they referred me to somebody and the doctor said, oh, well, you just have anxiety and you're having panic. And, and then he said, I think you should go on Zoloft. And then I had anxiety about taking a drug because you know it might change me, yeah. heaven forbid. Right. You know, I'm, I'm so stable. Why would I want to be changed? You know, like, and that's the funny thing is, is, that, is that those of us that struggle with these kinds of things we're terrified of taking any kind of medication because we're afraid of not being ourselves. And yeah. yet the anxiety or the depression or whatever you struggle with is actually keeping you from being yourself. That's the anxiety or that's the anchor. Yeah. 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 And so I argued with him like a lawyer for six months. And then finally I gave in and, and started taking Zoloft and it was like a miracle. Um, when I took it, it was literally as if somebody had taken a volume dial yeah. and turned it to zero and that voice that would sound off in my head on a loop that triggered all the body sensations and we're going to talk a lot yeah. about this tomorrow like the difference between worry and how that triggers anxiety and then the difference between anxiety and panic and then how you can utilize the tools that i'm talking about to curb the worrying to control the anxiety to stabilize the panic and like really self-monitor and see i think that is the single greatest skill that anybody could have the ability to self-monitor you could call it mindset you could call it self-awareness but truly to be so in tune with yourself that in a nanosecond you pick up when things are going south with your thoughts that you understand how to monitor yourself, your behavior, what you're thinking, so that you align with your values and your choices. And for the first 40 years of my life, I didn't know how to do that. At 21, you- Sure as shit didn't know how to do it. But you saw through medication oh, what yeah. was possible. Oh, it was incredible. It was, like I found, it was like I found myself again. I had the capability. And look, you know, if you're somebody that really struggles with anxiety or depression, and it's the kind of thing like I had where it interferes with your day-to-day -day life, yep. you have to go see somebody. Biochemical. That's, I'm glad that you said this because I just, I'm not a doctor. I've held a, a fair bit of anxiety myself. I had one small bout of depression. It was on the backside of some a major medical problem that I had. Yeah. And I just gave the answer in, in this other show that I was filming around. It's like, there's like not feeling right and feeling off and bummed and there's like clinical hardcore depression and sometimes you don't know. So right. do all the things to self take, take care of yourself, the things that you know that you're gonna prescribe in your class and that we're talking about here and you need to see a professional too. Oh, right? absolutely, yeah, yeah. absolutely. In fact, you know, like I, I talk about it so openly because first of all, I think these days most of us have some level of anxiety um, and I think it's only going to get worse because of social media and technology and the fact that people work 24-7 and just the way yeah. that the news cycle kind of bangs at you all day long. Um, but I also talk about it openly because I really view it like something that's akin to diabetes. You have a chemical imbalance and if you had diabetes, there's no shame in taking insulin. Yeah. If you have a chemical imbalance that's causing you to torture yourself mentally or make things harder, go freaking talk to somebody and see if meds would work for you. I, yeah. I really believe that. Yeah. And so what happens is it'll, it gives you a leg up. Like I've seen this with, with our 12 year old too, who um, started taking Zoloft like, I don't know, 10, when he was 10 for a period of time, because he had gotten into such a hole with anxiety that he was not doing sleepovers. He was not getting in elevators and he couldn't get out, not with the cognitive tools. Yeah but it gave him the leg up to be able to then let the cognitive tools take effect and the new habits to take over. And then when you can do a new habits, that's ultimately about yeah. getting off the medication if it's, or not. In, if it's in your yeah, yeah totally. Your purview. Yeah. Totally, so, so that was kind of the beginning for me of this awareness around anxiety. And I was on, um, I took Zoloft for a while and then of course I felt good. Mm -hmm. 
So why do I need it? You know? yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and of course not going to therapy. And so um, uh, that's, I, I went off it when I, when I had Sawyer, who, who is our firstborn daughter, who's 18 now, who I had the terrible bout of postpartum with. Yeah. And so then I jumped right back on. And I stayed on it until about five years ago. And five years ago, um, after introducing the five second rule, you know, to the world and having it go crazy viral, I started to wonder because I saw how it was, how I was using it as a starting ritual to change all my other habits and to learn self monitoring and um, to be the person I really want to be in the world and in my marriage and as a parent. I started to ask myself, gosh, you know, if I can change all these physical patterns that I have, I wonder if I could change the thinking patterns. And so I went off Zoloft for the first time in like 15 years. I mean, that was terrifying. Yeah. And um, started using the five second rule to monitor my thoughts. How powerful is that? It is the most freeing Remarkable. I mean, I just yeah. get so choked up thinking yeah. about this because, I mean, so many of us torture ourselves. Yeah. You get, I, the, the thing that drives me is not being on stage or having a successful book. It's the fact that we're getting close to a thousand inbound stories and emails a day. That's amazing. And the strategies that we are teaching are working. Yeah. And... People are not committing suicide. They're using the five second rule in um, therapy for PTSD. They're using it in CBT therapy. They are using it in addiction. It has been the most rewarding thing in the world to see that something so simple, uh, just a little technique, and that's basically what I focus on is, mm -hmm. what are the small techniques that we can all do in various areas of our life and business that give us a leg up? that give us control, that give us the ability to catch ourselves before we ruin it, you know, before. Yeah. And so it is the most freeing thing in the world that you can do to learn that you don't have to think the way that you think. It's, it's amazing the connection, the physical body, there's the studies, the science is indubitable at this point, the, the mind-body connection. Right. And I think also so many people um, well, I want to get your take, but just conceptually, the connection between our well-being and our thoughts. And when you, you, you realize that your, thought, your actions, like I'm going to reach over and pick up this glass of water, but when you realize that, um, that your brain is a two million year old computer that's programmed not necessarily to make you happy, but to make you survive and right. to create anxiety as a mechanism for staying alive in the wilderness, mm -hmm. that but when you realize that you can actually be the boss of that, it's Tony Robbins, not related, talks about like it's the brain, it's not your brain. Right. Like when you realize that you can be the boss of that through the five second rule or something else, that what an amazing transformation is possible. It's really, I mean, it's, it's the beginning point for everything. Right. And um, the, you know, the other thing that, um, that was really, remarkable is, you know, we spend, we spend a lot of time talking about mindset from the standpoint of think positive so positive things happen. And I do believe in having a positive mindset, obviously. Mm -hmm. I think that the actions that you take are way more important in terms of developing that mindset. Yeah. But we don't spend enough time on what you were just talking about, which is understanding how the automatic nature of worrying about stuff all day long, how that is making you less money, how it is making you less happy, how it is disconnecting you from your spouse, how it is keeping you unhealthy, and how it is a habit that robs you of joy and opportunity and power. And it is one of the easiest habits to break. All right. That is a very badass statement. <laughs> I love it. So can we just, can we go there just for a second? Sure. Like, um, tell us how. I mean, you have a practice. Well, I'm going to introduce really quickly the five second rule of the book. Um, congratulations. Thanks. Taking the universe by storm, millions of readers. Um, 
the fact that you've been able to then socialize it also through radio and through things like this and Creative Live and all these other places, um, it doesn't, what I find beautiful is its simplicity. So use that as a, as a sure. door, door to walk, walk through that door that I just gave you and yeah. tell me like, A, how you came about it, you know, what it does and how you can sure. unlock some of those things that you talked sure. about, like get out of your own way, well, make yourself healthy, totally. make your business more successful with being able to control your thoughts. Yeah, um, well so, number one, um, your life happens in five second windows. Number two, in five seconds, you can control what you think, you can decide what you're gonna do, and you can change absolutely anything, which changes absolutely everything. And so the five second rule is a mind trick. That's all that it is. A fancy way to, to call it is a, you know, it's a form of metacognition. But it's basically a hack. It's a cheat code. Okay. And the way that it works, and this is the challenge with getting it out there, is that it sounds so profoundly stupid, like a gimmick, that it took a while for people to actually take it seriously. I get that. I get and that. to really stack up the science to make you know, anybody that interacts with it go, holy shit, like this actually works. Yeah. So here's what it is. Basically, the moment you catch yourself hesitating or doubting or starting to worry or about to chicken out or shrink or shut up or whatever it is that you're about to do that is shrinking your power, you just go five, four, three, two, one. You count backwards, five, four, three, two, one. Um, what happens when you do that? Don't do it out loud because it'll scare somebody. Like, like, <laughs> like a psycho. I mean, five, yes, four, three, two, one. I'm talking. Is. Yes, exactly. No. <laughs> My turn. <laughs> yes, exactly. Although, you know, we, I, I say it's it's so simple that people this use it with their kids. This is a Saturday Night Live skit in the making, it's right? Totally. I can see this. I would no. love that because that means I've really made it. <laughs> True. Um, uh, your kids will use it on you. So my kids will use it on me. So if I have a certain tone that comes out, I'll hear my 12 year old go five, four, three, watch that tone, mom, you know, just, um, or mom, five, four, three, two, one, I thought you were gonna go to the gym. Um, yes. <laughs> so uh, by counting backwards, the, the uh, kind of cheat code that you're doing in your mind is you are interrupting what are called habit loops that get encoded in the central part of your brain and you are starting up the prefrontal cortex. It's a little trick that causes focus, and it's, it's a lot like having a mantra, because mm -hmm. you're shifting gears, but the thing about having a mantra is, and I suppose that as you count backwards more and more and more, you become used to yeah. it, mm -hmm. but it becomes a habit that triggers action. So what you do is you go five, four, three, two, one, cut off this part of the brain, awaken this part of the brain, and then move. And what happens with the counting backwards is, there's nowhere to go after one. And your mind is socialized in a countdown situation to go. Yep. And so um, counting up won't work because you can keep you go going. forever. <laughs> and you do it in many aspects of your life, so it's actually not something that requires any focus. Mm -hmm. See, the prefrontal cortex in functional MRIs is, is lit up like a Christmas tree when you're doing something that requires courage, when you're engaged in strategic thinking, or when you're learning a new behavior. Uh -huh. So we've invented, or I created a, a little cheat for switching the gears manually between the part of the brain that actually makes changing difficult and keeps you stuck, and the part of the brain that you need in order to change. So five, four, three, two, one. Yeah. And then you engage in the behavior that you're afraid of or that the crocodile brain part is saying, uh -huh. don't do this yeah. or this yeah. is going to be scary yeah. or bad. Or... Yeah. So if you're sitting with a client who um, constantly scope creeps on you and you know you want to say something, but you start to feel that hesitation, you're about to chicken out, five, four, three, two, one. And they say, hey, this is outside the scope of what we talked yeah. about. It's not going to, you know, yes. it's not a huge deal, but we just need to redefine yes. the scope to it. Yeah, you say whatever. Or if you have a drinking problem and you feel yourself drawn toward it, 54321 interrupts the habit of grabbing for it based on whatever trigger made you want to have the drink, and you turn and you move away from it. So it is a way to have courage in the moment. It's a way to have self control in the moment. It's a way to be present and, you know, 
awake in the moment. It's a way to interrupt patterns of behavior. I use it right now for my tone of voice. Mm -hmm. um, I use it because um, I get like in the zone and then I have this edge to my tone of voice that I really don't like. And the more that we do video and I see it, the more I'm like, oh my gosh, I don't want to sound like that. Um, I use it for sure to exercise because I hate to exercise. I still, eight years later, I mean, I, I discovered this thing in 2008 by mistake, trying to beat my habit of hitting the snooze alarm. Incredible. Yeah. And um, I still, every day, use it every single morning to get out of bed. Every single morning. I hate getting out of bed. <laughs> I hate Love this about you. it. I use it now that I'm 48, uh, soon to be 49. When I wake up at 2.37 and I have to go to the bathroom, I use it 5, 4, 3, 2, 1 to just get out of the damn bed. Because you know what we all do at our age. We yeah. lay there and they're like, okay, just go back to bed, just go back to bed. But you, <laughs> that doesn't work. 47 <laughs> minutes later, you still have to pee. So just 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, get up, go to the bathroom, come back, go to bed, all good. Okay, so you developed this hack, and I think it's a very, like, scientifically, you're shifting it from the crocodile brain into your frontal cortex, yeah, so you change totally. that. And what has that unlocked for you what do you like is it is it truly that simple or can you then walk us through a couple of like um, activations or some of the results that you've seen or sure. what you've experienced I mean you just talked about getting well, out of 2008 bed, but... let's just talk about where my life was okay. my husband's restaurant business was failing we had a lean that had hit the house I had just lost a the first television show I was going to shoot and was stuck on a contract not getting paid okay so unemployed bankruptcy Chris is sleeping on the couch, raging, like drunk, like drinking way too much, like totally out of control. Mm -hmm. And um, n the thing that we're also that that I that I think we're going to cover tomorrow. We'll see. We'll see what sure, comes up. Sure. Um, I think knowledge can be a huge trap. And what I mean by that is we spend a lot of time acquiring knowledge about what to do. But most of us don't spend enough time figuring out how to make ourselves do it. It's not the strategy that you're lacking. It's the action. Push. Yeah, yeah it's the action. And, and the thing that, that I found for myself, and I'm sure that whatever it is that you're struggling with or anybody is struggling with, you're probably really frustrated with yourself because you know what to do to lose weight, but you can't make yourself do it. You know what you need to do in order to grow your business, but you can't make yourself do it. And so I was stuck in that extraordinarily, I think, human experience where I knew I should get up on time. I knew I should look for a job. I knew I should be supportive of Chris. I knew I shouldn't drink at night. I knew that I shouldn't, like, that I shouldn't isolate myself. I knew I should go see a therapist. I wasn't doing any of it. And um, I was really, really struggling. And it's so ironic that I'm now, what I talk so much about is how to build confidence, like the real confidence, how to build courage, because I had none of it. Yeah. And so, um, you know, I invent this little thing just to beat the snooze alarm because the kids kept missing the bus. And I felt like the world's worst parent. And so it worked that first morning. And then here's what, what I can tell you is that I said earlier that in five seconds you can change anything and that'll change everything. And I also think you're one decision away from a totally different life. Because when you're the kind of person that's sleeping in every day and waking up and feeling like a loser, and you make one decision that all you're gonna do is actually just get up, no matter how painful it is, what happens is that one decision makes you see yourself differently because of the action you're taking. You've broken the habit or yes. the whatever. You know, yes. It's possible. Almost. Yes. And so I made myself a promise once this thing worked three mornings in a row to get out of bed. And the promise was this. If I knew that I should do something, no matter how much I didn't want to do it, I was going to use this stupid rule, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, and I was going to give myself a push. And so I would get up on time and I'd walk into the kitchen and the first thing I would see was Chris and I'd just want to kill him, you know, I mean, because we're fighting yeah. like crazy and it's so much easier to do the old, it's your fault. And I would feel that wave come up 
and I'd go five, four, three, two, one, and it would give me the self-monitoring and the self-control to realign what was about to come out of my mouth with what I wanted, which was I didn't want, I, I wanted to save my marriage. I wanted him to be successful. Cognitively, I knew all this. Yes. In the moment, I found through these five second windows that I could gain the self-control to pivot and do it. I would see my sneakers and know all the science says you're supposed to exercise, but boy, oh boy, when you need it most, you don't feel like it. And I would do that thing where I'd look out, I'd see the sneakers, I'd see it's raining. I'm like, nope, <laughs> five, four, three, two, one. Grab the sneakers and go. It, so one small decision at a time, I started literally moving my life in a direction that aligned with the things that I wanted. And in seeing myself do it, that's when your confidence and the momentum and all the wonderful stuff starts happening. And so, you know, I've literally gone from that period of my life unemployed and tremendous financial strain and tremendous marriage strain to making more money than I ever thought possible, being a complete shark of a negotiator. I mean, I'm an asshole because <laughs> I have no fear. Yeah. I can literally, in a business discussion, see what I want, I know what I'll settle for, and if I feel the emotion coming up, I push it back down, five, four, three, two, one. And that is a powerful thing to have in business because most of us live in fear and we have the scarcity feeling about what's gonna happen if you say no. Don't get the job or the gig or Correct. the contract. Or the, yeah, yeah. Correct. And it's also helped me wrestle the ego piece to the ground because there's so many things that you do in business and in life that are really driven by deep insecurity and the need to fill ego mm -hmm. versus the things that actually matter to you. And so it just is this incredible little perspective checker all the time. And it's like, it's like a self-coaching tool. Like if you have a best friend that's a pain in the ass that's constantly pushing you, this is a way you become that person for yourself. And so, I mean, I could give you example after example after example. I mean, even the book, like, you know, people told me I was crazy to self-publish. And, you know, I would have loved to have made the New York Times list. Love to. Um, because I come from the Ivy League. And that's the And ego. I come from that's ego. That, yeah. And, you know, I want everybody else that's fancy to look at me and be like, ooh, she made that list. And then I started to realize, well, wait a minute. Um, what do I really care about? What I really care about is doing, is first of all, having control over what we're doing. Secondly, being a smart businesswoman so that I own everything. Mm -hmm. And most importantly, how do I actually make sure this idea, idea spreads? That it spreads as fast, as simply, as freely as possible. And so, you know, we made a decision that we would self publish the book, which I would tell everybody to do. And it, what's interesting is my book came out the same week that Tony's did. And we, it, it's, it's interesting because the only book that outsold me via, via book scan that week was his. And we outsold the other nine books on the list, but because we were self-published and didn't have a lot of bookstore distribution, you know, we didn't make it. Sure. And so, of course, I was like pissed. And so I'm like, five, four, three, two, one. I'm like, Shh, forget it. I'm just going to be mad for 24 <laughs> hours. I'm going to drink five Manhattans and go to bed and take five Advil and then get up and I'm going to be over it. Um, and I was angry because I felt like I earned it because of the sales. Yeah. But then I realized, wait a minute, it's the ego. yet again, this is that ego thing. And I think there's a lot of things that we all do that are so driven by that instead of really stopping and saying, what is the long-term game here? Yeah. And so we had a really interesting thing happen. And we, we, um, I want to talk about this because I, I'm sure there are lots of aspiring writers that are watching. Um, because we didn't have a lot of distribution, and because we basically pent up all the demand for that one week spread, Amazon sold out in about 15 minutes. Barnes and Noble sold out immediately. Couldn't find the book in Canada because I, they had sold out. No stores had it. And so what happened is- um, What can I get in the market immediately? Yes, <laughs> they went right to Amazon and right there was, you know, the book is available in two weeks or you can get Audible right now. So. The other thing that I did is for whatever reason, you and I know that you believe this too. I, I read a couple yes. interviews where you were 
you were saying that you know you had read an interview with Steve Jobs and you believe that you absolutely have to trust your gut, even it's even though it's hard. It is so critical that you develop that skill. It is it's the most unsung skill in our culture, I think, is listening to it. And the five-second rule will give you the courage to actually hear it, or will give you the clarity to hear it and the courage to follow it. So for whatever reason, I said, because we worked with a, a like a self-publishing person that printed the books, and I just said, there is no way in hell you're getting audio. There's no way in hell you're getting audio. It, I'm severing the rights. I didn't even know what the hell that meant. Severing the rights. Sounds good. Yes. <laughs> Sounds powerful. Go on. I'm a good negotiator. Yes. Five, four, three, two, That's one. That's fine. I, I, you're not, because it, because because he, he said to me, because he, here's what's happening. We're in the thing. I don't even know what I'm talking about. I'm listening to this. I've gotten the right deal yep. that I wanted with this, the printer publisher person that was going to help me self-publish. And he said, uh, you know, audio is part. I said, absolutely not. I said, what could you possibly do that I can't do myself? I can rent a studio. I can talk into a microphone. I can go to Amazon and I can upload the files. So if I can do the things that, you know, you're why do I need you? And yeah. why would I cut you in? Like it's one thing because you're printing the books and setting up the books and shipping the books and storing the books and dealing with bookstores and dealing with I don't want to deal with any of that stuff. Yeah. Take your commission. Goodbye. But audio, there's no cost after you record the file. Nothing. Zero. Zero. Zero marginal cost. And so many authors right now, the game has changed, absolutely, positively changed. I'm a huge fan of audio. Just, I mean, that's why this is syndicated on it. It used to be a video show, now it's primarily an audio show. Um, I started talking into my phone, into Siri, when it first came out and people thought I was bonkers. They were like, what is this dude doing, <laughs> talking, yep. like holding his phone up? And my V1 Siri got so good. At, I mean, you know, it, the the AI and stuff right. it was really it was very basic back then. But I just realized the things, the 22 things that I could say to it, and it would do all the things correctly, and it was freaking people out. Like I'm very, very passionate about it, and the fact that this to me, this is one of the reasons I was really excited about connecting you on with you on this is this to you by admission earlier before we start recording or in the show. I've lost track was a game changer for you. Oh right? my gosh, it's, So you, it was, you moved a lot of units in the, in the book form and then audio is where it really went kapow. I mean, in the first five months, we sold 150,000 audiobooks. <laughs> what are you laughing? That's awesome. Guess who owns it? I do. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, now, can I also though say that, um, and, and that was the, honestly, that was God or the universe's reward for listening to my gut. Yep, because you saw on that thing. And that was also and... my reward mm -hmm. for not going for ego. Like, I think when you really align your actions with your values and with the true outcome that you're seeking, it is incredible what happens. And so first it was, I'm not going to spend 35, like when you guys walk past those books in the airport and you go, oh, I wish I could be there. You can. It's $35,000 for three months. Thank you very much. That's right. That's the big lie that nobody knows. The end caps in the bookstores, you can pay for those too. And now, you know, you can buy your way onto the New York Times bestseller list, but you have to know what you stand for and why you're doing something. If that's something that you have to have. To take a picture and send it to mom. Yeah, or because it will be a game changer in your career. Great, make the investment, but go in being fully aware as well. that that's what you're doing. Yep. Because there's a cost to that decision. This to me is where I wanna go next. So you've said it a couple times, you've been um, either intentionally or not, sort of leaving a little breadcrumb here. And I'm gonna go pick all those breadcrumbs up <laughs> because the what the path the breadcrumbs are pointing at, which is what's important is in using the five, four, three, two, one, using it for the sake of using it is really not all that important if you don't know what you want. So you, I, I, this is a very important piece of your TED talk, which I found very inspirational. And you've said it several times here, like values lining up with what you want mm -hmm. and then enabling yourself to, through self-awareness and all that, to take action and to do it. So mm -hmm. one of the things that I have having, you know, 
whatever, have an audience of people who are watching and listening and have for years and years and years and sat down with folks like yourself, what I realize is that a lot of people ha struggle to define what they want. Help, help the people. <laughs> tell, t tell the people what the, what Small is the, request. what is the thing that's getting in the or that you've seen yeah. that's getting in the way of people being able to define the things that they want. Well, let me see if I can answer this um, succinctly. Um, so, the mistake that we all make is that we focus on the person, place, or thing. And that we tend to focus on something way too big. And that creates a gap between where you are and this magical you know, rainbow oh. cafe <laughs> unicorn thing that you think is going to rescue you from your miserable you know, life right now. And um, that gap can start to be the thing that makes you feel lost. And so I think that um, when it comes to figuring out what you want and discovering, I guess, what your passion is or your direction is, first you've got to learn to listen to yourself in the smallest ways. And so I recently developed a tool that I haven't been talking a lot about because um, I'm still doing a lot of research on it, but it is deadly accurate and it works in five seconds like the five second rule. And it is the secret, I think, to helping people figure this out. Uh, and you're not going to tell me <laughs> this is the... Like... I will tell you what it is. I don't have a name for it yet. You don't have to. So I imagine it like... Wait, what is the raw? This is the unplugged, behind the scenes. So first of all, I when I hear the word passion, and you didn't say passion, but that's kind of the word that people use for mm -hmm. that. I need to figure out who I am and what I'm passionate about and where I'm going, and what my values are. I believe that passion is another word for energy. That's it. What do you have energy for? What energizes you? Mm -hmm. And that we naturally have a tremendous amount of body wisdom about that. And that every one of us has an internal fuel tank that is either empty or full. And if you're empty, you feel depleted. If you're full, you feel energized. And so if you simply are in any situation, I mean any situation, and you um, pay attention within five seconds to, does this person energize me? Do they deplete me? Where are they in the scale? You just gain some tremendous wisdom and you, the simple way to start to figure out who you are and what you want is start aligning yourself with more things that energize you. So situationally, if you're lying in bed and the snooze alarm goes, or the alarm goes off, and you feel depleted, and you start reaching for the snooze button, that's a really big sign that you need to get out of bed. Now, being depleted versus energized has nothing to do with whether or not things are hard or easy. It has to do with what naturally actually either expands you or shrinks you. And so if you look at your client list and measure it depleted versus energized, what shrinks versus expands me, you have the actual map. And when you start to find the courage to make decisions, that energize you and that expand you, whether they're scary as shit or not, that's when everything changes. And so that's how I actually make business decisions. Is this, I don't even, like the money conversation comes second, it's does this deplete or energize me? And if it depletes me, how do you move it in that direction? Or how do I stay, say no? If it energizes me, how do I do more? And so like two years ago when my speaking career exploded out of nowhere, based on that TED talk. Um, I, it was great for like a year and a half and then suddenly I started to notice that the anxiety in the mornings was creeping in when I'd have to leave town, that I just felt kind of low and depleted. And I realized that actually being on stage kind of depletes me. That the thing that energizes me about the speaking business is 
meeting people, and it's the emails I get. And so I started to pay attention to that and say, how do I do more of the thing that, of the thing that naturally energizes you? Because if you are energized or expanded by something, you will do it for no money, you will do it happily, and you will suddenly wake up and say, oh my gosh, like my, I, I'm pursuing my passion. How did that happen? What well, happened one five second alignment at a time in the right direction so that you were actually working with your natural wiring, working with your natural energy, tapping into your wisdom. So again, the five second rule is this tool that allows you to tune in and give you the courage. This is a tool that gives you the wisdom that you need in order to make those decisions. And so when I get wigged out because I don't make the New York Times list or whatever, um, I tune back in. Well, what is it that's energizing me? It's not some stupid ass list. It's that this idea is helping people. And is, is it your philosophy then that by tuning in and following what energizes you, that is the path? And if you 100%. have percent, you have the path now, you use the five seconds. Because I'll rule. tell you why. Okay. You can't, until you actually learn the wisdom of you and the power of you, you can't look at the big stuff and successfully, in my mind, go get it. You'll be the kind of person that maybe checks boxes, but never feels satisfied as you do it. You're always on to the next. You're always chasing the next because you yeah. have run right past the number one thing that you're supposed to figure out in your lifetime, which is who you are and how to listen to it. That's so powerful. I think the, we referenced Tony Robbins earlier. Um, what I, there's a thing that he says that it is conjured up when you say that is there are people who've been wildly successful. They have um, mastered the science of achievement, mm -hmm. which is the ability to get shit done and check boxes right. and run at things. But what they have failed to master is the art of fulfillment, which is who are you? Why do you do things? It's like the Simon Sinek, the why, like what gets you out of bed in the morning? And unless you are... that, This is the way you find the answer, honestly. Yeah. Because if you can't listen to your own wisdom about whether or not you should get up or whether or not you should exercise or whether or not you should curb that drinking problem or whether or not you should like get over your fear of cold calling and start doing it, you can't master the little stuff. You will never answer the big stuff, ever. So powerful. It's so simple. I love it. And it took me a long time to figure out. You know, I was just having this conversation with my daughter who um, is starting her first year in college and she's going through all kinds of anxiety and, and was like just, we were just having this conversation where she was making new friends and you know that thing where you have your roommates but you don't necessarily want them to tag along with your new friends and yeah. then you don't want your new friends to tag along with your roommates. <laughs> and I looked at her and said, listen, it took me literally 45 years to learn this lesson. I mean, I didn't say it. I was like, don't be a passive aggressive bitch, okay? Like just, the world's a big place. There's no kind of set number of friends that people are supposed to have. The more generous you are, the more generous you are, the easier and more satisfying and fun your life is, period. So and it took me so long, I don't know why, to realize that there's enough success and happiness for everybody. And the second that you figure out how to stay in your lane, which is where are you energized, where are you expanded, and still be able to cheer, that's the other, that's actually I think how I figured it out, is that when you if focus in your on lane, in yeah. your lane, which is what your wisdom is telling you, energizes and expands you, you have so much capacity to cheer for everybody else. And what's fascinating is, you know, so this audio book that started off kind of like, this is the reward. It, it caught fire. Um, one of the reasons, it's one of the most successful audiobooks of all time for Audible already. And we're already six <laughs> months in. It's the most successful self published one that they've had. <laughs> um, so and it's only gaining steam. It's put us, um, Amazon has launched all these most read lists, like the top 10 most read, the top 10 most wanted, the top 10 bought. We have been on it since they launched because of the audiobook. Um, and the numbers that it's driving. And so, you know, what's, what's interesting is that 
I've had a ton of really famous authors call me. Like there's a famous author that I'm not going to tell you the name of that called that sent me an email uh, yesterday, and the first time I got the email, I'm like, what the. What does this guy need me for? He's freaking best friends with Oprah, for God's sakes. Like, listen, why is he calling me? You know? And then I realized I had a little bit of that old residue of, I'm not telling them my secret. Like, you know, yeah, like, yeah, yeah. You know, I'm not. And then I was like, wait a minute, what? Five, four, three, two, one. Knock, that's not. Wow. There's enough room for everybody, period. Period. And so, you know, I, um, I am so committed to just trying to stay in that space. Because the thing that I find very difficult with my own psychology is I have the propensity, because I'm intellectually curious, to look at what everybody else is doing and then either use it as a way to beat myself up because I'm not like, I don't, I don't have the platform or I'm not whatever they are or whatever I'm, you know what I'm saying? Sure. Or to convince myself that I'm not doing it the right way. And it is, I find it to be one of the biggest challenges about running a business right now is that there's so much, there's so much information about what other people are doing that it can really pollute what you focus on. Yeah. And so it's super important to always look around, but then calibrate it against this idea of what, what expands versus what shrinks you, what energizes versus what depletes you. It's cool, right? It's so cool. And you, I'm going to try and like go into the little last segment of our talk here. And you did a nice job, incidentally, I think, of opening the door for me because you talked about um, into the space. And when I, when I think of your space, um, there's the personal space that you occupy, the things that you desire is your lane. But there's also the space that you've either very intentionally or accidentally backed into, which is the human performance or um, self-actualization, mm -hmm. the space, and it is wildly absent of female leadership. I think there's and a handful. Diverse, yeah, diverse, diverse so, voices. Some, there's a handful of, um, of women who I feel like have taken a small, um, or taken a huge amount of a small um, space there's a few slots there and mm -hmm. to me we have to change that same with people of color yeah and i was wondering if you could talk a little bit about that I think sure it's, um, well you know, th like, the first thing that i would say is that i did stumble into this because what happened is i never i invented the five second rule by mistake i transformed my own life and marriage and just who i am as a person using it never intended to tell anybody because it sounds so damn stupid and plus i didn't really understand why it worked i honestly thought i'm a witch I've come up with a spell. <laughs> I've come up with a spell. It's amazing. Ooh, you know, like, <laughs> so I, uh, I, you know, went on to go, you know, join CNN and had a syndicated radio show and launched a little content aggregator and sold it. And I was just, and Chris, re, Chris actually saved the restaurant business. Like, life was good. And I gave that TEDx talk. And it was actually about, like, career change, uh -huh. truly. And I let the, I let the, the rule slip at the end. It was an afterthought. I, don't, I didn't even explain it because I didn't really know how to explain it. And people started to write. So we heard, we've heard from more than, you know, I don't even know how many at this point, but by the time I had heard from about 100,000 people yeah, in like, 67 countries. This is a thing. It wasn't even that it was a thing. It was that when you have three or four people write to you and tell you the story about how they didn't commit suicide, and that they used the five second rule to turn away from the railing or put down the pills. I felt an obligation to figure out and be able to explain why something so simple creates such profound results. And what I also learned is that when you email the world's leading researchers and you have CNN in your name, people respond to you. Yep. <laughs> so nice. all of a sudden, Everything that I had ever done was preparing me for this moment. So the law, which teaches you how to take super complicated amount of information and synthesize it down to one takeaway, basically, yeah. or key takeaways, that came into play. The understanding that advice is boring as hell, so you've got to be entertaining to actually have people pay attention. 
um, just my natural curiosity, my business acumen, like it all came into like this. And um, I then as the talk, the TED talk took off and people started asking me to speak. Um, and I started sharing the research, things started taking off. And that's when I looked up and we're like, oh my gosh, there's like no female speakers and there's like nobody in personal development. There's a lot of amazing women yeah. in the spiritual space. Yeah. There's very few of us that cross over and mind, body, business, performance. Yeah. And, you know, I don't know why that is. I don't know if it's because of the same reasons that um, uh, there's a lack of diversity in corporate environments. Mm -hmm. I don't know if it's because it's a small world. And so when I look at people's podcasts, everybody has the same guys on all their podcasts all the time. Um, but the thing that's always fascinated me is that when you look at the data, the majority of the products and courses are being bought by women. Wow. And so there is for sure a huge opportunity. Now here's the challenge as a woman. If you go too much after that particular market, then you label yourself as a, you know, as, a, as an expert for women. And that then, like Oprah never branded herself as a brand for women. Yeah. She spoke to everybody, but attracted whatever, 87, 93% female audience, but she never actually became a brand for women. Yeah. And so, you know, I've made a very mindful uh, business decision not to do a ton of women's conferences, not to have a ton of speeches about women and bias in the workplace, which I know a tremendous, I've done a tremendous amount of research in and can explain the science and can explain what bias is and can explain how we learn things in chunks and how thing, bias gets encoded and how it's like peanut butter and jelly. And yeah. once you have that pairing, it's very difficult to separate. Like, I mean, yeah. so I could write a book about women in confidence. I could, and I'm fascinated by it, but it would be catastrophic to my appeal to humans across the board. I mean, right now, when we look at the fan base that follows us and we're a very data-driven company um, in terms of informing some of the decisions, almost 45% of the people that follow me and buy the stuff that we do and certainly that sit in the audiences are men. And so I think that there's a huge thirst for more diverse audiences. There is, um, I didn't answer your question why, I don't know why. No, I, but to me, this it's the conversation that it's like, you don't have to have an answer, but we need to talk about it. Like, that's the thing that's well, not Well, the other thing that's happened a lot with me, you and I are similar in that we started somewhere else yeah. and found our way into being curious about personal development, being a student of it. Like, you know, you don't talk about stuff that you don't actually do. Same with me. Yeah. I have been shocked by the number of people that have told me that it is so refreshing to, to be around somebody <laughs> that didn't read a book and became a coach and then in somebody else's program and now has their, not that there's anything yeah. wrong with no, that. I get it. Everybody finds their way. And if that's what you're supposed to do, fantastic. But I think one of the differentiators, of course, is that I'm a woman. The other differentiator is that I do cross over to business and have a very loud and strong business point of view and a, a legal background and a media background. And I did a lot of other things before I stumbled into this. And um, I also don't think I have the answers. I think I'm figuring it out in real time and I'm just dumb enough to be sharing it as I'm going. I think that's brilliant. <laughs> you know? I just, yeah, I... I Because I like the connection. Just, I like the feedback. I like learning from other people. Yeah. Yeah, that's, and that's, that's part of the nature of my question. That's why this show exists in part. It's a little bit of a selfish, like I'm trying to learn from the people who've done it, from people who are better me and different me. And, and I'll tell you also why there aren't a lot of women in this. Yep. Because we do get attacked differently. You say something provocative and you're an asshole. I say something provocative and I'm ugly or I'm the C word or I'm some, you know, bitch that nobody, like, and who is, you know, I mean, it gets so personal, mm -hmm. so fast. Um, and if there's one thing that I learned at CNN and being on the team there, which has been a remarkable experience, um, it's literally how to 
if I if somebody comes after me, I love it. You know why? You don't attack somebody who hasn't who hasn't actually poked yeah. you. So yeah. if I say something that makes you that angry, there's a kernel of truth that really angered you. And so I see that kind of um, I've, I've developed an insulation and a perspective about it that actually al helps me in this business. Yeah, it's, uh, well, And I think it's very yeah. difficult for women because we do get the things that, that people say to the female on-air talent at CNN are disgusting compared to what they say to the guys. And, you know, there's tons of research about it, about how we get attacked for our appearances or clothes, never, almost yeah. never for what you say. Brene Brown is a really good, she talks about the same thing with the TED talk and when she gave it about vulnerability and shame and like. Um, oh yeah, people talked about yeah. like what she was wearing. Yeah, it was just it was horrible. Um, I love your perspective on it. Um, I think we need to culturally, and I also, there's this <clears throat> crazy feeling of optimism that I have around the rise of the feminine um, in a historically male-oriented world, I feel this shift and just even words like vulnerability and the fact that you're in the position you are and you're um, dynamic and all, all of the things that um, I feel like you've A, represented in this conversation, but also the classes, the TED Talks, it's, it's so inspiring and I'm trying to get more of it and <laughs> if, if, like, yeah, just um, if there's any advice that you have for anyone who's listening or watching, we're all ears. And it's, it sounds like you, you, you feel like you don't know, but even In terms of more women, I, I just think that like um, for women, it's if you have, if, if what your gut tells you is that that is, is that the online course business or the speaking business or writing, or like telling your story, mm -hmm. if that is something that really energizes you and expands you, five, four, three, two, one, use that tool to push yourself through the fear and through all of the, the, the obstacles that you're putting in the way. Every day, just push a little bit further. I think for those of us in the space, um, number one, we need to be way more um, proactive about um, seeking out diverse voices. Mm -hmm. And this is something that's just coming to mind. Mm -hmm. But I think since a lot of experts these days are now forced into the position of having to market themselves, that we get very siloed. And that sense that, like I remember the guy that does Art of the Charm, I can't even remember his name, like he, he was gonna, he wanted to have me on the show to talk about the five second rule and then he found out that Lewis Howes had booked me. And I can't have you on it. And so like there's just like a, you realize there's how many billions of people on the planet yeah, and not everybody's listening to the same stuff. And yeah. so I think there's a very insular like mindset about, um, I don't know, who's paying attention or, or how much overlap there is. And the, you know, it's like, yeah. you, you know what I'm saying? Like it just seems, so I, th I think if, if, if people were, and, I, and I, see, I, see, I see lots of examples of people really trying hard to bring lesser known voices, diverse voices, yeah. you know, I don't know. I don't know the answer. I don't. Now you've given us plenty to think about. Your class, we kept saying like tomorrow, 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 just <laughs> as a reminder, you're, you're going to be on Creative Live tomorrow. So anyone who's listening to this. Later, you yeah. can buy it. <laughs> like, yes. Yeah, we're not live right now. So 99% uh, yes. of what we do is free, but this course you can buy. <laughs> <laughs> um, super excited to have you. Thank you I'm so too. much. And I'm dying to... Um, I'll be glued to your class tomorrow. Oh, I, can, gosh. I can sneak in. I hope the it room. doesn't it's, suck. It's not going to suck. It's awesome. Um, thank you so much for being on the show. And big fan. We're gonna. I'm gonna just continue to push your message. I think it's brilliant. The five. Just four, three, take two, it. One. It's not my message. See, that's the thing. It's not my message. This is an idea that everybody on the planet needs to know. You can't actually end with a better statement than that. Thanks for being on the show. I appreciate it. Hey, I folks, want a hug. Folks, oh, take you're not going to give me a handshake, for gosh sakes, after that. All right. Um, I'm going to sit back down again so you me guys too. can. Exhausted. Thanks again. Appreciate it. Exhausting. Uh, you guys for tuning in. It's exhausted. We're going to just like, <sighs> and until tomorrow, 
or maybe the next I'm gonna week. I'm going to go get working tomorrow. on that PowerPoint for you this should. class tomorrow. You should. You should. <laughs> so, until next time, bye-bye. <laughs>